literally walked outside of the building and I just, I just stood in this alleyway for probably like a good five, 10 minutes with this raging headache. And the only thing running through my mind was, man, this is the, the hardest thing that I've ever had to do in my life. Like it, it felt phenomenally difficult. CBD Junkie Dental Podcast is about connecting with passionate Australian dentists who are improving themselves and have attended various CBD courses. My aim is to find out for you the best CBD courses around and what they did to help get them to where they are today. So you can consider doing it and becoming the best dentist you can be. What's your thoughts on um, giving out free coffee if you're 20 minutes late? <laughs> is this uh, is is this uh, excerpt from our website or something? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let's talk about this. This is great. Okay. <laughs> so I think th- this is going to come back into to practice ownership for a moment. But you know, when you open a when you do anything in life, I think a lot of us start out with really idealistic expectations, whether it be a our CPD, we're going to go to this implant program and, oh yeah, they said that like after three months of the continuum, you know, we're going to place our first implant, blah, blah. And look, a lot of these things don't always pan out the way they should be. And practice ownership was one of those. And I started out with very idealistic expectations of, you know, what does it mean to own a practice? Like we're going to have this, this team culture, you know, we're going to be a, a family and and we're going to, yeah, if we're 20 minutes, if we're more than 10 minutes late, we're going to give our patients coffee and and we're going to like do all these special things and be all different and, and everything. And and then, you know, over time, you start to really realize why dental clinics are a certain way because, you know, yeah, I'd love to be able to give people coffee for, you know, if we're running a little bit behind schedule. And, you know, for a while we did do that, but but life gets in the way, you know, and things get super busy at the clinic and, and the cafe, the cafe that we used to work with the, to give these vouchers doesn't want to do it anymore, blah, blah, blah. And so um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, coming back to the question around opening a practice and, and even CPD is like, we've got to be really realistic with these things and, and not try and change the world, whether it be with our dentistry or with our dental practice um, straight away. And, um, you know, maybe realize that, that there is, there's a reason why there's a status quo, so to speak, in the way that things operate. Um, dental practices, CPD programs, our own learning. And it's been like that for a very long time and it's not suddenly going to change overnight. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's generally been like a big business learning lesson is that, um, you know, you got to keep things simple. And same with implementing a CPD, like keep it simple at the start. Don't get the fancy kit with the hundred, you know, different instruments and the forceps that they said take out wisdom teeth quicker than, than the other forceps that your boss already has, you know, you just got to work with what you got. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, if I'm not wrong, did you do some sort of leadership development program, business admin management thing at one point? <laughs> I, I signed up, but I never, I never actually attended that. I think I need to <laughs> take that off my, my, I think it's floating around somewhere on the internet. And yeah, I signed up to this course and, and you know, that happens, right? We sign up to a course. It sounds good. This was an online course. So this is the problem, right? With online courses <laughs> is you got to find the motivation, the time, the dedication to, to make it happen. <laughs> and yeah, I didn't, it was bad timing for me um, when I signed up to this course. So I signed up, I think they even like graduated me by accident, even though I didn't, <laughs> um, I never actually attended any of it. Um, but I mean, yeah, that's online CPD is, uh, that's another thing. I don't know if you, do, have you done much online, Lawrence? Uh, online CPD? Yeah. I mean, I do do the Kings one through correspondence. So yeah, that's, I guess, in one sense. Is all, all the coursework is online or? A lot of the coursework is online, but there is face-to-face component where I got to fly over to London, which I recently went to. Um, Ooh, how was that? Then. And that was great. It was great. Yeah. Um, obviously, dentistry is very hands-on. So you need to do something that's uh, that has a hands-on component to it. Because otherwise, you know, if it's just all theory, how are you going to supposed to retain it all? Right. How do you find the motivation? Like, how do you find in terms of discipline and everything to to get through that content? Or, or do yeah, they yeah. do they kind of keep you accountable? So I think um, like anything, um, it's how much you put in. You know, as I find out in the first year is, you know, the more you put in, the more you get out. You know, if you put in a little in, then you're only going to get a little out of it, right? They're not going to spoon feed you anymore. So it's, you know, it's really up to you and uh, what you want to get out of the the program. Yeah. 
fair. Like most things in life. Yeah. Like most things in life. Yeah. So no, nah, I never, never completed that. Um, would have been nice. It sounded good. <laughs> but um, oh man, I've signed up to all sorts of online CPD and never made my way through. Um, but you know what? That's the good thing is it's always there. So I can still uh, reaccess it. <laughs> yes, that's right. So, I mean, what is the most interesting case that you've ever worked on and what did you learn from it? The most interesting case. Hmm. Doesn't have to be, you so, know, out of this world, but like, you know, <laughs> to you, that was memorable because obviously you took something out of it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to use this as a, I do a lot of teaching at the uni. I'm going to use this as a, as a teaching moment. And I think that in, in dentistry, there is, uh, there's this idea that the, the, the peak, the pinnacle of dentistry is, is doing these full mouth cases, right? It's the, you know, the full mouth rehabilitation, you know, when you when you're doing full mouth rehabilitations, that's the, you know, I think all of us have this in our, in our mind, like that is the peak, like you, you're, you've reached ultimate dentist. And I remember is probably about, I think my first full mouth rehabilitation was probably about two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago. And, and I remember this case being the singular, most difficult thing I feel like I've ever done in my life. Mm. And I remember being there. It was, it was a complex. It was a mess of a case. It was, it was mostly, it was just a crown and bridge case, like, you know, severe wear, um, full upper lower crowns bridges sort of thing and uh, you know I remember being in the midst of this case and we'd, we'd like I'd prepped him like the upper arch went fine but then the lower arch like I had to do it across I think two appointments or something and and I just remember being there for this this was like his, his like second or third preparation appointment because I mean I mean anyway I do things differently now but but um, you know I wasn't sure how to stage it at the time so we we're just kind of working through as we could and uh, I just remember being like knee deep in four hours into this this case, like just trying to bloody, you know, do these preparations or put these temporaries on. And if, if for anyone out there that's tried doing this sort of stuff, you, you'll know that the feeling of, oh, you've done all the preparations and you feel like you're finished. And then you go, oh, shit, I got to these temporaries. And you think, oh, temporaries, you know, that's, that's a couple of minutes, right? And, and then you go to make the temporaries and you realize the temporaries take longer than anything else. <laughs> they take longer than the preparations and, and everyone, you know, you probably, if you do any CPD on this topic, you always hear that, you know, you hear the experts say, you know, the Lincoln Harris's, et cetera, that, yeah, the, the temporaries take a lot longer for me than the preparations. And you don't really believe it because it doesn't seem to make sense. But when you actually do it, you go, oh, yeah, crap. That's, that's how it is. And I remember being, yeah, knee deep in this case, the patient, you know, the anesthesia is wearing off because I haven't managed, you know, managing anesthesia for these cases is is, is not easy. Um, and I haven't managed the anesthesia. And is the, you know, the case where you're sort of working through it, the patient's like, they're not in pain, but they're, like they're visibly uncomfortable, but you've like, you've given them so much LA and you don't know why it's, you know, not working and, and you're just trying to get the the damn thing done. And, and I'm yeah four or five hours knee deep into this and, and I've got a pounding headache at this point, like, like excruciating. And I remember at one point I just, I left the practice. Mm -hmm. I, I literally walked out of the, I just told him, look, we're just going to, you know, just going to take a break for a sec, whatever that this numbing set in, I don't know. And I, I literally walked outside of the building and we've got an alleyway mm -hmm. near the practice. It's near a train station. I walked into the alleyway and I just, I just stood in this alleyway for probably like a good five, 10 minutes with this raging headache. And the only thing running through my mind was, man, this is the, the hardest thing I've ever done that I've ever had to do in my life. Like it, it felt phenomenally difficult. Mm -hmm. And yeah, to me, that was just so memorable because and since then I've done a bunch more cases like this and it gets easier and all that sort of jazz. But uh, you know what? I remember coming to the end of that case, you know, we'd inserted everything. I've seen him for reviews multiple times now, you know, he's, he's two years down, everything's going fine. Um, he loves it. He's happy, nice guy, etc. cetera. He was a great patient. Um, but I remember coming to the end of that case and even to this day, you sort of think about it and you go, wow, I, you know, sometimes with these, these sort of things, we put patients through a lot right? Like that is, that is a lot to put someone through, you know, these multiple sessions, the full mouth anesthetic, you know, the change in the vertical, like everything. It's a lot to put someone through mm -hmm. and it's a lot to put yourself through. It's a lot to put yourself through as a practitioner. I remember coming to the end of that case and, 
and reflecting on it and going like, man, is this, if, if this is the, the peak, if this is the, the, the pinnacle of, of dentistry, like, I'm not sure that I want it. Like, I'm, I'm not sure that it's all that it's cracked up to be. I mean, it takes such a toll on the patient, on the clinician. Sure, you get better, you get quicker, it's maybe easier and all this stuff. But, um, you know, I think that if you want to do these sorts of these sorts of work to a really high standard, um, it takes a lot. It takes mm-hmm. a lot. And to me, the reason why this whole case was so memorable, because I look back on it and I ask myself, man, was, was it worth all this? You know, mm-hmm. and, and, and to this day, I don't know. I mean, the patient loves it. You know, the patient thinks it was worth it. But, you know, in my mind as a clinician, yeah, and, and I think we're always battling that idea too with these cases that uh, even with today's, you know, adhesive additive stuff, you know, we're still, you're still cutting down teeth. And it's, it's, I always talk to patients about this idea where, where you know, often we're, we're sort of taking um, one step back to go two steps forward. You know, when it comes to dentistry is where we're cutting things down to build them back up and, and yeah, sometimes I look back on these cases like I don't know, was it, was it worth it for me, for me, like mentally, physically, um, even financially, and and was it worth it for the patient, you know? And and uh, uh, yeah, I, I just think it's memorable because I still look back on this case and I still wonder, you know, if I saw this patient again, you know, how would things have panned out the same, differently? I, yeah, I, I made a lot of silly, silly things with this case, but I, I was like, oh yeah, my first full mouth rehab. I'm going to do it all like very minimally invasive. It's all going to be like non-retentive onlay preparations and all this stuff. And man, for your first case, if you're trying to do a full mouth of that sort of stuff and temporizing it, it is disastrously challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but that's a different story. So yeah, very memorable for me, big learning lesson. And I think it, it's just that, that intersection where, where, you know, dentistry crosses over with, um, yeah, you just start thinking a bit more philosophically, like, you know, the impact on yourself and on the patient and, and you know, the net balance of it all, you know, what, what impact have you really had on this person? So, mm-hmm. yeah, man. So you mentioned, you know, just briefly about how, you know, your, your faculty um, teaching um, mentoring at the university. Can you talk to me about how that kind of came about and, you know, what do you do in that, um, on that job? I think anyone that wants to be proficient at what they do should teach what they do at the end of the day. There, there is no, there's no greater honor. There's no greater skill to develop than there is teaching. And, and, and it, it, it's a beneficial skill for everything in life. You want to open a business. I am teaching every single second of every day, my staff, I'm teaching my patients. Like the, 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 the skill of being a teacher is, is phenomenal. And I think it's a shame. I think a lot of, um, communication cpds they they sort of miss the mark on this a little bit as they you know, they talk all about like having patients see the value and see the problems and whatever other jargon they use but at the end of the day like we're, we're just teaching we're just teaching right and so i think developing that skill is is really crucial and um yeah to me i always wanted teaching i always wanted to be a teacher uh, my mom was a teacher um i always just liked the idea of it and so i just approached the uni after um we finished in in final year i just sent the coordinator an email said hey i really want to do this thing can i can i do it and they're like yeah come and so i came and i uh i you know in my first year out which is a bit stupid if you really start to think about it but in my first year out i was already teaching the students uh, in the in the simulation clinic you know, I was teaching the, I think the second years uh, when they're working on mannequins and yes. telling them what to do. And when I didn't really know what to do it myself, but you know what? <laughs> students ask the best questions. They ask the best questions. And, and those questions force you to, to introspect, to reflect, to learn, to grow. And so, yeah, I think it was a really blessed opportunity. And, and I know the university still does it to this day. And, and I'm not teaching so much of this year because I'm just struggling to find the time I'd love to be. So oh, I'd love to create the sort of weekly schedule that would allow me to to do a lot more teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, and so ever since then, I, I taught for La Trobe Uni for many years now. Um, you know, whether it be in simulation clinic, um, lecturing as well, uh, it was lots of fun. These days, I'm I'm not the biggest fan of the the Zoom lecturing concept, so that's I'm not <laughs> teaching as much now because um, yeah. I, I found that you know I taught all throughout COVID. You know, and and it was phenomenally challenging um, mm-hmm. to to get students to engage. I mean, you're you're 
And if there's any students listening out there, I mean, come on, guys, you got to you got to pitch in a bit more. We're trying to like you try to like really pull them out of their screen and into into the you know into the discussion because. I mean, that, that's the best kind of learning, right, is when you can interact and engage and, and think and critically analyze, evaluate. Um, and, uh, you know, pulling people out of their screen like that was just so challenging. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of that style of, of learning. It's fine if you're just doing a one-way, you know, lecture or something, but that's not how you really learn. So, uh, yeah, but I love teaching and I'd encourage everyone to, to get into it reach out to your, your university or um, or even just get involved in helping teaching. So uh, what I mean by that is helping in, in private CPD. I mean, I know GDR is, is always looking, Alex is always looking for people to help out. Um, a lot of these programs, you'd be surprised if you were to reach out and say, hey, you know, I'm willing to give up some of my free time to help supervise or, you know, help do the catering, whatever it is. And all of a sudden you've got access to the CPD for free. Maybe you're getting paid for it. Um, I think it's a it's a great way to get involved in the dental community and also just to give back, just to give back a little bit. I mean, I think a lot of us could probably agree that some of the most memorable things from dental school outside of the, you know, the fun stuff with friends, et cetera, is actually the teachers that we met, like a couple people that really I think everyone has one or two that stand out in their mind that really, really set them on a certain trajectory. Um, and I mean, yeah, the, the potential to sort of be that person. I mean, that's. That's how cool is that? Mm. I mean, one, if Alex gets bombarded, we'll know what's up. We won't know who to blame. Two, I mean, obviously, you're a teacher to many. And as you've alluded to, you know, who's been a teacher for you or pivotal in your career path and why? Oof. <laughs> That's a good one. That community for me, you know, I have so many people I can add on this list. I'll, I'll give them some shout outs. I mean, if we go back to university days, um, the, there's a professor of endodontics, Philippe Zimmert. Um, he's been, he's, he's super well-known in, in the endodontic community. He was such an inspiration when, it, and everyone at Latrobe will agree with this when it comes to just the sheer, you know, when you see just someone that's sheer and purely dedicated to the dental industry, you know, this is someone that was on the way to lectures. He'd be like, you know, each year, every lecture on the way, you take the train up from Melbourne to Bendigo and he'd be updating the slides, you know, every year, you know, who, who does that? Most lecturers use the same slides they used 20 years ago. He'd be updating them every time. He was so dedicated to that pursuit of like the most up-to-date knowledge um, and in sharing that and being accessible to the students. So shout out to Philippe Zimmer. And um, I mean, in the, in the private, uh, I guess, you know, since, since, since uni graduating, my first boss, shout out to Ian Harper at Harper Dental. He taught me everything I know about microscopes and about the pursuit of excellence when it comes to like technically executing dentistry. I mean, this man had, and still to this day has a microscope, an operating microscope, like a $30,000 microscope in every operatory in his, I think he's got 10 ops now. He's, he, what is that? He spent like $300,000 just on microscope. I mean, who does that as wild, right? Um, <laughs> This man was just so, you know, dedicated to this concept of, of high quality dentistry and, and, you know, this concept that the better you see, the better you do. And to this day, I do 99% of my dentistry under an operating microscope. And I think everyone should have the opportunity to experience that. So, yeah, definitely a big shout out to Ian Harper. And, you know, from a business point of view and sort of practice ownership, I'll give a shout out to um, Dr. Tiv. You're probably acquainted with him. Um, you know, he's been you know, instrumental in, in, in just helping me, uh, yeah, just navigate some of those kind of workplace challenges. Um, and also, um, I'm going to miss so many people. Cal from North Fitzroy Dental. Do you know mm-hmm. Cal? I have, uh, we've been trying to get him on, but not yet. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Legend. Just, a, just such a nice guy and always, he'll always respond to my messages. Um, and he gives so much and asks for so little. So big shout out to him. Big shout out to Mel um mel melissa huang who uh, she's got to practice uh white horse dental again she's like coist trained and and very like uh, you know traditionally trained in some of those dental techniques and um she i met her because her sister was going through gdr at the time mm. um and i observed that her practice and she's always i mean i messaged her yesterday asking her if she knows a good bookkeeper um so i could go on and on shout out to alex and to James, you know, um, one of my friends, James Bartolotta is always there for me when it comes to Invisalign. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, early on, I think we're a bit more level now, but <laughs> early on, I, you know, he was, he was a year down the aligner pathway before I was. And so early on, still to this day, I still reach out. Um, and he would just, we would just look at every clinic check together. I mean, you know, I think that's how we learn a lot of the dentistry, right? We just, mm-hmm. you just kind of do it. And then you sort of, <laughs> you sort of, um, uh, you know, as much as you can study aligners as much as you want, you just got to start doing cases. And that's what I did. I just started doing cases. And, and, th- and by the way, uh, that's why I'd recommend everyone to get into aligners because at the end of the day, there is, I think there's no other aspect of dentistry where you can do all of the learning outside of the patient, right? Because you can take photos, you've got your scans, you've got the clean check or whatever, and you don't need to be sitting there in front of the patient trying to do your crown preparation thinking, did I do it right? Did I not? Because you could be doing that outside. You know, you've got all the records, you're doing all the learning as you go along side by side with someone the, the stress is so much lower compared to any other aspect of dentistry. You know, you want to learn implants. Yeah. The first couple of times you're going to do it, you're going to be shitting your pants, part of my language, because um, yeah, you could have someone near you, but the patient's there, you know, you don't want to be seeming incompetent in front of the patient. And, and so it's a bit awkward. You can't really ask questions and you know, blah, blah, blah. Whereas with, with aligners, I mean, the world's your oyster. You, you've got all those records outside you can get. And, and to this day, I still, from time to time, get James, we just jump on zoom and he just, you know, moves the clinch check, gives me his thoughts. Um, so, uh, yeah, I could go on and on. A lot of my friends, um, are doing really, really cool things at the moment. And, uh, you know, anything to do with full mouth rehabilitations, I'll, I'll give a shout out to, to Sally, Sally Afshar. I always reach out to her when it comes to like veneers and stuff, cause she's doing a lot of that stuff. Like, and as you grow that network and everyone goes in different pathways, I mean, you know, this is the, the, the best part of it all is just that community that you can really rely on and, 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 um, yeah, I just encourage everyone to just partake in that community a lot more. I think mm-hmm. that everyone would be the better for it. Yeah. So what does your current ideal clinical day look like? Or what are the things that you're getting up to? <laughs> My ideal day is being at home. Like today, <laughs> you know, lazy start. Just picked up some bagels this morning, about to make some bagel toast. That's my ideal day. Uh, look, I think that, you know, in dentistry, and one thing we maybe we don't realize as students with time is that dentistry is hard from the perspective that, you know, a lot of us are sitting in this small three by four meter room. You know, we may or may not have windows. You know, if you're working under a microscope like I am, you're looking at this tiny field of view and it's it's a very isolating profession and, and the days are long, the days are hard. Um, and yeah, with time you start to sort of think, okay, well, yeah, maybe you do love all this learning and everything, but what does that ideal day or week look like, like you were saying? And to me, you know, I don't know what that looks like yet, but but I'm not convinced that it, it looks like, you know, five days a week sitting there in a three by four meter room working patient to patient. Um, I think with time, you also start to, or, or I've started to realize that some of the limitations, you know, when it, when it comes to being a clinician in the sense that, you know, we're limited to helping those 10 or so patients that we might see in a day. And, um, you know, at a certain point, you, you know, some of us start to think, okay, well, maybe there's other ways that I could help patients or that I could help the, the dental community. And, you know, to me, I think more and more, you know, that's, that's what I'm interested in is, is sort of looking into uh, the other aspects of dentistry, whether it be business related, community related. Um, I've always got different business ideas running through my mind and, and I'm sure I'll pursue some of them at some point. Um, but yeah, clinical dentistry, I think that it's a, a lot of us don't realize until we get, you know, when we go through uni, we all think that we're going to end up as clinical dentists, right? That's the only thing that uni tells you about. Uni doesn't tell you that you could go in and invent a, an AI software that will diagnose caries for dentists, or they don't mm-hmm. tell you that you can run your own private CPD courses and maybe earn a living that way. Like there's many ways to earn a, earn a decent living in dentistry. And, uh, I think that's another thing is this, uh, how many people do we know, both of us, probably Lawrence and ever, everyone listening, how many people do we know that maybe don't really like clinical dentistry? You know, maybe they they do it because it pays all right and that's all they sort of know, but they don't really love it. And, you know, in some sense, isn't it a shame that those people don't explore all the other, you know, career opportunities that dentistry has has to avail? I mean, I've got a friend that, that was a dentist and now I'm... 
I think maybe she went back to working one day a week, but for a long time she's, she's working and, uh, and I won't name her, but she, she was working as a dental sales representative for a company, like an, an up and coming, you know, really cool company. I think she'd even maybe bought into the company. So she's sort of a, like a part owner in the company. Like there's so many things you can do in dentistry. And so mm. to me, you know, I'm, you know, more and more, I'm very open to those other opportunities, um, you know, teaching as well. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, clinical dentistry is just part of it. And I know your podcast is really on, you know, it's on CPD and then the clinical side. And, um, but you know, there's a lot of other opportunities out there that I think a lot of us can pursue. A lot of us would, would maybe be happier for it. So I'm definitely looking at exploring those opportunities and maybe crafting a week that is uh, less clinical. Right. I follow. Well, I mean, now that we're on that point, so do you have any wise words of wisdom for the budding young dentist or, you know, key skills or attributes that they should be focusing on developing? Yeah. I mean, if there's any takeaways from our discussion, I think the, we touched on a couple of really key things. One is community. Um, you know, there is, there is no greater service you can do to yourself and to the dental community than partaking in it. You know, attending those CPDs, messaging, you know, people after the CPDs, making those connections, becoming friends with people in the dental industry, whether that be, you know, uh, sales reps, whether that be, you know, other dentists, because as you become friends and you, you sort of lean on people more, you, you everyone's just going to rise with you. Everyone's going to rise with you. And, and especially if you can, you know, get onto a CPD program that fosters that, you know, those programs that are a year long or whatever, where you do really band together with people on that same journey, um, whether it be GDR or otherwise, you will, um, you'll be all the better for it. So that's number one is really embrace and partake in that sense of community. Number two is, is be open to non-clinical opportunities. You know, coming off of what we were just discussing is, is, you know, try, do a bit of teaching, try volunteering at a CPD program or reaching out to university um, maybe talk a little bit more to your sales rep next time and understand, you know, what, what do they actually do? What does their day look like? Maybe that's something that you'd want to partake in. Um, yeah, just be open, just be open to different things and don't get, get the blinkers on. Like I need to be, uh, I think I've used, uh, I don't want to pick on any over. I was going to say, I need to be Lincoln Harris. Like I need to be the master of, of, of all things, dentistry and do full mouth rehabs every day. And, or, or I need to be that cosmetic dentist that does the Botox and the, you know, the veneers every day and, and uh, all of that. And <laughs> yeah, so I would just say be open and, and, uh, and be careful not to get caught up in the social media stuff. I'm sure that comes up a lot here, but, um, you know, if you talk to a lot of the people that are putting out all this very pretty stuff, it doesn't mean much. I mean, you talk to them, a lot of them are still unhappy for different reasons and um yeah just don't compare yourself too much yeah i would say and you know coming back to the topic of decisions is is don't overthink it you know start with that buffet of cpd try a bit of this bit of that you know the cheapest stuff the stuff that gets you the high level um whether that be again individually picking things out or, or something like gdr that's pretty affordable um and then at some point, if there's something that you sort of resonated with, you just go for it. Just sign up to that year long program, that two year long program. And then during that time, like really commit to it. And then who knows? I mean, I know tons of people that have done a two year ortho continuum and did maybe one case and never touched it again. But you know what? I don't know a single one that if you were to ask them if they regret it would say yes. I don't know a single person that would say they've regretted it. In fact, I don't think I know a single person that would say they regretted any CPD to be honest, because we all take something from it, good or bad or otherwise. So, um, yeah, I just say don't overthink that decision making process with CPD and, and um, just say yes more, you know, do more, expose yourself to as much as you can. And then as you're a few years out, et cetera, that's where, you know, I said, like, for me, CPD now is like super niche. Like I commit myself to very few things <laughs> because, um, uh, yeah, it's just the time thing, but also, um, yeah, you, you really start to, to focus on things that are actionable. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So, what, what are you committing yourself to? <laughs> if you don't mind me asking. I was thinking about this this morning, actually. I was like, oh, I wonder what I'll do for CPD this year. <laughs> uh, not a lot, to be honest. I think the only thing that's on my radar at the moment is uh, I would like to... Well, actually, two things. Maybe one potentially is 
you know, now that I had my first implant failure, I'm like, oh, okay, I gotta, I gotta button down and, and, you know, upskill a bit more there. Um, so that's number one. But number two, I think a big thing for me is I see, and maybe a lot of people will agree, I see a lot of gum recession, like huge amounts. Like I, I almost, it's, it's unbelievable how common I see uh, gum recession. And so to me, I send a lot of patients out for gum grafting. And, you know, having a baseline level of surgical skills with a wisdom teeth removal, um, to me, that seems like a natural progression now is, is to get into soft tissue grafting. Um, so I've observed the procedure. I've got a dentist that comes and does the grafting for me at our clinic at the moment. So I've seen the procedure. I, I understand the basics of it. And uh, yeah, I think I'm ready to maybe do a bit more learning, like maybe take a one or two day course and then, um, yeah, just start start doing a bit of soft tissue grafting. Yeah, mostly for um, not 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 to do with implants, but you know your classic. You know they're they're just brushing too hard uh, across the uh, canines, premolars, etc. Um, so I'd love to be able to add that in because I see it so often, so mm-hmm. often. How many of us, you know, back at uni, I think well, a lot of us we would joke about the. Do you ever joke about this, Lawrence? The Jura fat emergency. <laughs> no. No, we, we, we had a running joke where it was like that emergency patient that came in where they just had gum recession and we would just tell them there's nothing we can do and we'd paint some Durafat on, just some fluorine. And then we'd send them away and say, oh, it should get better. Just use some Sensodyne. And yeah, we called it a Durafat emergency because <laughs> like that's that was the limitation of our skills, right? That's all we knew is like, yeah, you just give them some Durafat. Um, but, uh, yeah, even yesterday I saw a patient come in like, you know, extreme sensitivity and it's gum recession, it's exposed root surfaces. And yeah, I just think that, um, yeah, it's a really relevant skill set and a really natural progression from a surgical point of view. Mm -hmm. Well, get ready for more purchasing of instruments then, hey? Uh, you reckon? (laughs) Nah, what do you need for gum grafting? I'll just use my... You know, the microsurgery tools. I like to keep it simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another thing I think with dentistry at time, you realize is that like if you saw my filling kit, you'd, it's like two instruments. <laughs> like, you got to keep it simple. If you want to if you want to be able to implement these things daily in your practice, it's got to be easy because otherwise you're never going to do it. You won't be bothered. It's like taking photos. If taking photos of your clinical work is not easy for you because of the way you've set up your camera and stuff, you're never going to do it. So I like to keep it simple. Mm. I've, he- I've heard a younger dentist you say something about micro speed and macro patients. Wow. Yeah, that's a throwback. That, that rings a bell. <laughs> yeah, I think as far as CP, was that, I don't even know in what context I would have said that. Do you know CPD or? It was um, just in general learning to be right. okay with patients over time, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, sounds like I was wiser then than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> so dr daniel thank you for coming on the show today if you could let the people know how they can find you oh yeah i mean uh, just honestly reach out instagram facebook um uh, i'm sure lawrence will have some links in the in the description and stuff uh yeah just and i love that when people reach out and i try my best to to reply to most most people and yeah, like every other week I'm on the phone with someone just chatting about something. So um, please, you know, it comes back to what I was saying before, just connect, reach out. And um, yeah, I think we'll all be all the better for it. If you like this episode, drop a comment below on your favorite part or leave a review. Don't forget to share it with your friends and we'll see you in the next episode of CP Junkie Podcast. <laughs>